Hey everybody, welcome to Linuscast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm your co-host, uh, Steve. Yeah. He really needs to get a name tag. If he had a name tag, he'd remember his name. Hello, my name is Steve. It's probably, probably I'll be work. your uh, I'll be I'll be your uh, handler today. <laughs> All right. So this is the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy things. Uh, it has been a couple weeks, Steve. Uh, we've had some time off. So last week it was Tyler's birthday and Josh was out. So we took the week off. The week before that, I was without power for five days, which was crazy. Um, and I know Steve knows how that feels, but here in the in the United States, you know, we're not quite used to it. Uh, also, no power whatsoever. <laughs> we don't get random times on, so it, it it was not great, but it was okay. We we survived that, and uh, then we picked up a shit ton of trees, like like a lot of trees. That kind of storm, uh, yeah. the storm that picked up the trees. Yeah, it was trees. like like 140 mile an hour winds here for for a while. Yeah, it, wow. it was it was pretty it was pretty intense. Anyways, that's in the past. That's the reason why we were off for a couple of weeks, uh, and we decided to go ahead and go along this week, even though we've been abandoned by the other two members of our crew. Um, like I said uh, in the pre-show, Josh is off at Linux Fest Ohio. Uh, Zany had a few things that came up and he had to do. So it's just Steve and I. We're going to have some fun. We have a topic for you. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But first, as always, we talk about what we've done in, since the last episode in open source. So, Steve, what's been going on with you, man? Uh, I've been ironing out Zero Linux because something happened uh, with, uh, with my brain. It, it, uh, it, it got unlocked. I got new ability unlocked in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the way I'm going to put it. But I realized that I wasn't describing Zero Linux the right way because it's, it was coming across as a uh, noob-friendly distro when it wasn't. That wasn't what, why I, what, what I intended for Zero Linux. But I wasn't in the description. Everywhere in the description, I was, say, I was saying uh, an easy way to install Arch Linux that you can shape your way the easy way. I, uh, that easy way kept breaking my brain every time I read that sentence. And now, finally, I understood why. By saying the easy way, people thought that it was a, a noob-friendly distro. So I had to take that burp away, the easy, that part away, and uh, I added to the description, this, this distro is not for everyone in quotation, and I explained that on the download page with a small blurb with the help of, uh, of John. Uh, or Springles on my server, shout out John. He uh, he helped me write the blurb in a, in a very friendly way because the way I had written it was coming across a little bit too condescending or pissed off type of connotation. So uh, we fixed that, and now I had to take a few. Th I have to take action on Zero Linux as well to make it uh, not less noob friendly, but to be perceived better, understood better. Like, for example, I had PAMAC on Zero Linux. And to me, I was, it was like I was going against my own ideology, philosophy, that it's uh, uh, giving the user the choice to shape it their way. But if I had PAMAC, the, pa the GUI, if you don't know, PAMAC is the GUI package manager for Arch created by Manjaro. So by including PAMAC, the users Coming to the user that is coming to Zero Linux will see that I already have a GUI package manager included on it. Why be curious and see if there's another one that suits me the best? There's already one included. So I was like, no, I got to remove that. So they get curious and they select one. For example, I recommend to people try something called Bauh, B A U H. Uh, it's a pretty neat uh, package manager that supports app images. Web apps, AUR, flat packs, and other uh, formats, and it has a notifying a notifier uh, tray icon as well, and you c it's super customizable. So uh, I worked on that aspect of Zero Linux to so people understand that there will be no hand holding on Zero Linux anymore. Hand holding is not what we are about. So are, basically, uh, just, what you're saying is that you're turning Zero Linux into Gentoo. Not really. I, I knew you were going to ask that question, but... Uh, well, Josh isn't really. here. I had to. 
<laughs> well, of course. <laughs> but the, the, what I'm saying is, we need to. Uh, what I want Zero Linux to, to be, uh, I always wanted Zero Linux to be, is a distro that gets the necessary stuff out of the way, out of the box, but that will allow, uh, cause users to become curious and to start learning more because it's Arch. They are, it's so flexible. They can learn whatever they want, whenever they want, because they, they would want to do stuff. And to do everything on, uh, on Arch Linux, you, ha you have to read the manual. I'm not going to say the F part because I don't like the F part. It's just reading the manual. This is what Arch is. It's all about self-learning. It, uh, it, well, it's about learning, but te also teaching ourselves how to rely on ourselves. We're not re having to rely on the creators all too much. Because hand-holding is... And Glorious Agro in Brody's Tech Over Tea today said the exact same thing. Uh, he was like, we create our distros. We, and uh, there's a misconception. When we say no hand-holding, we mean no hand-holding when it comes to issues outside what we created. Like with Zero Linux, it's the tool, the rises. That's it. The configuration, the config. Support will be provided for that. But outside those two things, you have to learn on your own. You're not going to uh, expect somebody to uh, uh, answer you at every hour of the day. There are time zones. There are uh, times where we are all busy or stuff like that. So you learn by reading. So this will push you to read and learn and become self-reliant. So that's what I've been working on. on and sorry, I, it was long-winded, but I needed to defragment my brain, basically, and reintroduce Zero Linux under a, a brand new light by being more transparent. So, uh, and I was reworking some aspects of the distribution to make that more apparent. So, yeah, that's what I've been doing. And the other thing is I traveled to Dubai. I'm in Dubai right now. So, yeah. Cool. All right. So I've done a couple things. So first, I used DistroBox last night to install DaVinci Resolve and actually got it to launch on Linux. It was DistroBox is so which, cool. Which, 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 <laughs> on what? On Arch. Arch. Debian, on what? Yeah. I tried to do it on Fedora. I couldn't get fo to work on Fedora the Fedora DistroBox, which is weird because. It's one of the supported distros, or at least based on one of the supported distros. Um, but I just opened up my Arch distro box, went into the AUR, and downloaded it. And I'm still having a few issues with it, so i got to deal with some permissions issues because it's Linux. Of course, you have to deal with permissions issues. It's just, you know, what you have to do. And you got an AMD GPU, and that's an NVIDIA-specific program so how did you get past that i don't know it launched okay like i said i still haven't i still, I have to work right now it doesn't have access to the host file system so i can't really test it out but i got it to launch which has always been my like the first hurdle most of the time it just won't launch um so now and now you won't. gotta still figure out the gpu part well, um, Michael Horn, he's a fellow YouTuber. He has his eight AMD card, and he got it to run. So um, we'll see how that goes. Apparently, you just need to use the proprietary AMD driver. Not sure if that's what I'll end up having to do or not. I'm, I'm still just messing around with it. But that, anyways, that's what I messed around with last night. The other thing that I did yesterday was I finished up the Linux Cast merch shop. So there is now a merch store that you can go to, shop.linuxcast.org. And you'll there you'll find a whole bunch of really cool stuff. Where are you, you can... using? Uh, are you using uh, a Stream Elements uh, shop or which shop are you? Using? I'm using. It's called Fourth Wall, is what it's called. And, and you can set a custom domain to that. Yeah. Um, you can use custom cool. custom domain. You can have your own little website, um, and it has a ton of different products. So like. As of right now, let's see, I have a whole bunch of t-shirts, I have a, a notebook, there's some mugs, there's some hats, uh, there's going to be a... Do they, have, do they have cases for modern phones, at least? They have some iPhone cases, and it looks like a Samsung case. Um, there's a water, water bottle here, a framed picture of the logo, some beanies, stuff like that. There's going to be more stuff, but that's just kind of where I've started, so if you want to support and the if you want to support you're going to buy channel, your own merch and... Uh, wear it on on, on the I, podcast. I got some samples coming. Yes, um, we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, if you, anyways, if you want to support the the channel, uh, shop .linuxcast org is where you can find all the stuff that I have right now. So uh, th that's what I've really been spending the last couple of days doing. And uh, 
I have some pretty cool t-shirts that I've uh, come up with. So I, I kind of ripped off DT because DT has a whole bunch of like cool s sayings that he has on some of his merch. Now, I didn't steal any of his sayings, but I just thought I'd do kind of the same thing where I, you know, come up with some interesting, you know, blurbs or whatever I, for t-shirts. I use on my on my merch store on all, on all my merch. It's, I use R Zero Linux, by the way. So, yeah, anyways, that's that's basically what it is. All right, so well, I don't think there's anything else that I really needed to share in terms of what I've been doing. I've, I'm still going strong on OpenSUSE. I just made a like a half an hour video on uh, on OpenSUSE, so I don't really need to talk about it too much. It's just, guys, it is so good. But not, I've heard I've. I continue to hear from some people who just haven't had good luck with it, which is, I think that's just kind of the Linux experience, right? Sometimes some distros work fantastically for some people, not for others. Like for whatever reason, I've never had a really great experience with Ubuntu. Sometimes it just doesn't work on my machine for whatever reason. Uh, same thing with Void. Like a lot of people can get Void up and running on their machine. I cannot for life make it to get Void on my machine and actually have it working for very long. So not sure what's going on there. It doesn't really matter. So I mean, I think that's what some people just have a problem with when it comes to OpenSUSE. It just doesn't work with their hardware or whatever. It's I'm going to say one thing. Uh, OpenSUSE works just fine on my computer. I just can't get Fedora to work correct, uh, to stay stable for longer than a day. And I cannot get uh, Ubuntu to stay stable for more than 15 minutes. Yeah. Well, I think it's just what, the way things happen. Anyway, so let's go ahead and jump into the topic. So... We we got we got a big topic we're going to talk about today, and I ha, I am going to frame it a little bit to see if I can't kind of shape the conversation before we jump in. So there's this idea amongst the Linux community. Now, first off, what I'm what we're going to be talking about today kind of is going to delve into Linux elit elitism for a little bit. So just kind of be prepared for that. But the idea, or there's an idea amongst some people in the Linux community that the more new users Linux brings in, the more diluted the Linux experience will be. So that was the word by word. Diluted was the word that I was looking for. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the, the idea is that Linux is better when it's just for nerds and people who are really truly exper uh, interested in Linux. And uh, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Do we actually want a whole bunch of, how do I say this nicely, non-technical minded people coming into the Linux community uh, and, for lack of a better word, diluting the experience for the rest of us? What do you think, Steve? I think that we do need uh, such people because it will help us maintainers especially uh, distro maintainers specifically, understand better how to, uh, which angles to attack when we're working on our distros uh, and to make them more friendly, uh, uh, not easy, uh, no, not friendly, sorry, it, uh, easier to get the grasp of because, uh, as I said, some Linux distros like Zero Linux and Arch-based distros, not all Arch-based distros, mind you. There are some Arch-based distros that target n normies or new to Linux people. In uh, for 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 distros like Zero Linux, uh, it's and OpenSUSE. OpenSUSE is amazing as a distro, as you said. I, I've tried it and it works just fine. I just don't like using Zipper, but we need those people to 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 to, to start seeing. Linux from different angles and attacking uh, and fixing uh, things from uh, from a different angle, so they work for different types of people. But but you said you use the word diluted. This is I don't think it's gonna dilute. It's just if it's going to do anything, is it uh, we will start seeing uh, a lot more as we as other people call stupid questions or questions that are too dumb to be asked, but they're not dumb. There's no such thing as a dumb question. It's just when we have the knowledge and we start thinking about, okay, we see that question as being dumb because anyone uh, with a brain would know this. But no, that's a little bit condescending if we talk about it this way. It's disrespectful because there are people legitimately curious and have never used Linux before. So all their questions 
most of their questions are going to be a little bit dumb, a little bit simple kind of questions because they, they're starting from scratch on, on Linux. They're not starting from, they don't have previous knowledge. It's the first time they see Linux. Like for a Windows user, if I throw a Windows user uh, a MacBook, they're going to have the same type of dumb questions. But if you ask, if, if you ask them Windows questions, they're going to see our uh, questions as dumb because we never used Windows, for example. I'm just giving you, I'm using that as an example. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, there's no such thing as uh, something being diluted. There will, we want more people to use Linux at the end of the day. We want to, to, make, uh, to help the Linux world grow. But there's one fact that we cannot escape is the fact that Windows has the high, biggest market share and with hardware, hardware manufacturers building their, working on their hardware for Windows, not for Linux. There are the niche hardware manufacturers that like System76, what's the name of the other one? Uh, I forgot the name of the other one. Uh, they're building hardware for Linux, but those are niche. They're very small compared to the, the other like NVIDIA, like uh, 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 MSI, like uh, Logitech, uh, like uh, others, they target more Windows. The Stream Deck, not the Steam Deck, the Stream Deck it targets Windows, not Linux. There are some developers working on applications to make it work on Linux, like Deck Master. Thank you, Matt, for letting me know about that one. But uh, that doesn't mean that the hardware manufacturers are going to work for uh, to support Linux. So this is a fact we cannot escape. Windows will always be the big one. Yeah. So it depends on uh, users and their needs. If users need to use something uh, that only works on Windows, well, they need to use Windows only. So Linux for now is for the tinkerers mostly. That's how I see it. Okay, so I agree with most of the things that you said, but let me do two things. First, let me talk about the other side of the argument just for a minute kind of play a little bit of devil's advocate and then explain why that argument is wrong so uh, just know that what i'm about to say i don't actually think yeah. by bringing in more new users the attention of developers specifically of most open source software not only distros but basically everything will be focused on support of those new users instead of bringing in new features and making their software better. That's one area that you could argue too many new users takes away from attention and development resources. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it would be that the more new users you have, the less special Linux feels. Now, that's an ephemeral, very superficial uh, type of thing, right? A lot of us... Uh, I think that even people who are aware of feeling this way do feel this way somewhat. That if you use Linux, you feel a little special. You feel like you accomplished something worthwhile, something that other people can't or won't accomplish. Um, it's the source of it's the source of Linux elitism. We, you know, we all think that we're special because we use. Tux. And I think, like I said, everybody feels this somewhat. No, not everybody. It's, there, actually, what I should say is that there are a lot of people out there who just use Linux as a tool. It's not special to them at all. They use Windows too. They, you know, it's just they sit at their computer, they do a, a job, and they go smell some grass. I don't know what that grass thing is that you want me to smell. I've never seen this. I, I've never even seen a picture. I don't care to but for other people linux is a an accomplishment it's a it's a it's a hobby of some sort you know i know that's the way with a lot of us and not for everybody but you know you know and especially for that group it tends to be the more new users the more or less technical users join in on the fun the less it feels like an accomplishment you know that we think that it is now every time i say that stuff people think that I think that way. Uh, I don't actually think installing Linux is an accomplishment that you should, you know, get on a t-shirt. Although, maybe you should get it on a t-shirt. Um, 
I'm I'm just saying that there are people out there who feel like it's an accomplishment. Like, if you install Gentoo, actually, Steve is is a good ex example of this. When when you first installed Arch for the first time, the vanilla way, right? You feel very accomplished because when back then it was it was it was a thing, right? It was it was a process, right? It's not like a script like it was it is now. What were you gonna say, Steve? Uh, I just. I was just I was just gonna say uh, that I never installed Arch. You've Arch never vanilla installed way. Vanilla Arch the vanilla way. Oh my God, you're you've been banned. How can you be an Arch fanboy and never have installed Arch the vanilla way? We're we're gonna. The first <laughs> the first time I installed Arch was using Archify. Okay, well we're gonna have to. I'm we're... very frank. I, I don't like to lie to people to pre and I'm not pretending to be someone uh, to, to to know more than others. Uh, uh, I'm gonna say that I was like everyone else when I saw uh, uh, my friend uh, Hermano Ferrari from EF Linux uh, install because he he used to make now he works a, a job so he cannot make the same kind of videos as today as he used to but he used to make a monthly Arch install the Arch Vanilla Way videos. I got scared. I I was like, nah, I'm not gonna do this. It's it's too involved. It's and 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 my ADHD. And I recently discovered I have this thing where if I do if I do an action that is that takes too long, uh, I suffer from uh, anxiety, and I I cannot uh, and I start not uh, feeling like the clothes are closing, uh, the walls are closing in on me, and I can no longer breathe. That kind of feeling. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so doing it the arch uh, vanilla way is too involved too long and i would i was afraid i was going to suffer that again so i never tried it but archify is kind of similar but it's in a tui fashion you just tab space to select the options you want and it's st it was still involved because you had to select the packages you had to select the, the and you had to partition your hard drive the manual way but a little bit less involved than having to type the Wi-Fi stuff because everything is taken care of, uh, has been taken care of, uh, uh, for, uh, of for you. But now with the Arch install script, I can breathe. Yeah. Uh, All right. So thank there's the gonna, Lord for that. There's going to be an entire generation of Arch users who's who have never had to experience the vanilla way of installing Arch, and have always had the Arch install script. And then there's there's going to be the older generation who had to install it the old fashioned way. Back in the day, I had to install Arch. It took me 45 minutes, and uh, you know I walked both ways uphill in the snow and all that stuff. Yeah. So there's gonna there's a bifurcation there as well. So what the the thing is like somebody in the chat said that Linux is not an experience or something like that. It's like f for a lot of people it's not an experience. It's just a tool. But for other people it is. And for those people diluting or you know inviting a whole bunch of new people like the, the Steam Deck scared the crap out of a lot of those people because it was going to bring in a whole bunch of new people and it was going to make Linux feel less special. Now, like I said, I don't think that way. I'm more along the lines of what Steve thinks, and I think that it, we can even go far further. And I hate to break this to everybody because it's going to definitely be breaking news, but eventually someday Linus Torvalds is going to die. Um, <laughs> I don't I mean, we're all going to die, but he's definitely going to die too. He's not immoral. Same thing with all the other Linux kernel developers and the people who develop Firefox and the people who develop OBS and Blender and all the open source tools that we know and love. The people who have created them and are developing them, they're going to retire like recently, off. Like, and, like recently with the, developer, the creator of Vim. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they're going to die. And it's, it, it's sad to say, but it's going to happen. If we are a closed community that isn't welcoming to new users, we're not going to find people who are willing to replace those people when the time comes. We, we need fr fresh blood in order to bring in people who are going to be interested in how Linux works, how the kernel works, how it's developed, bringing in you know new th thoughts. I mean, the kernel developers have been very open to the idea of bringing in rust to the kernel right some of that is because the the newer younger people are more interested in rust and have been able to bring that idea forth right and it's that kind of stuff that is going to 
be needed as time goes on and the people who have been leading Linux for the last 30 years start to retire. And I mean, eventually it's going yeah. to, it's just, it's going to happen. So we need the new, the new generation to be able to be interested in that kind of stuff, to be able to learn. We, we need people who are in their teens. The way, the way you're trying to say it, to, to, to phrase it is we need new, fresh, curious mind. Mm hmm yeah, developers and stuff like that, and I I think that's good. it's gonna be a hard it's gonna be harder for us this time because back back in the the you know the eighties and nineties when computing was just kind of being invented really I mean obviously computers have been around for a long time but pe people just first started getting actual computers in their homes during the eighties and nineties and early two thousands they got these computers they were curious about how they worked and you know kids in their teens or whatever were tearing them apart learning how they worked how software works they were learning basic and they were learning you know early versions of c and c sharp and all this stuff and you know they were very curious about how computing works today's generation i hate to make this sound like an old guy um but today's generation doesn't feel as curious about how things work as the previous generation did, right? It just kind of feels that way. Now, it's, that's a uh, it's a generalization. Uh, I'm no, sure, but, sure that uh, are... you're you're very right about uh, about that because everything now is b becoming more convenient. It's 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 convenience over anything well, anything else. The the like younger computers generation are pre built. The pre computers uh, the pre built computers are becoming so good that building them is no longer as needed as it used to be uh everything is so targeted towards convenience 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 well, and There's people no are the curiosity people are more used to things like the iphone and the android phones right where it's just it's a it's a closed thing there's no tinkering on it whatsoever it just works the way that it works right and if you, exactly. you don't i mean even when the the iphone first came out I mean, what was the big thing you did? You jailbroke your iPhone because you were curious about how it worked and you wanted to install your own icon pack and you wanted to make sure you wanted to be able to reply to a text message without opening the message application. You know, all these things that you take for granted these days, you couldn't do in the early days of the iPhone. So uh, innovative people created Cydia and kept looking for, um, um, they, they were looking for ways into the Apple ecosystem so that they could actually jailbreak it and stuff like that, the, the hacks and stuff like that. And, hi and Apple hired half the people who created those apps and yeah. integrated them into iOS. Yeah, um, so that, that kind of thing just, I mean, do people still jailbreak their iPhones these days? Yes. I mean, I, I'm sure there's some yes. people that did, but it's not near. Oh, <laughs> I, can, I can vouch for that. Uh, it, one of them being a longtime friend, if he can't jailbreak an iPhone, he will go mad but it's not as so, big as uh, it once was right it's like uh, no it's no yeah it's very see small yeah because I mean, it used to be huge like um if you if you covered in, in in the early days of the iphone there were iphone blogs like the the, the iphone blog to be that's where one of my uh -oh. friends and i i i'm i met and um but you're talking to one yeah well anyways the, i geeks <laughs> it i i geeks this ig33 sdas dot com that was me. That was my friend. We had a, a podcast like this, talking about jailbreak apps, how to jailbreak your iPhone. We, it was a whole community. We were successful. We were getting donations. We even, at, uh, my friend was able to attend and advertise iGeeksters at an event where Sarek, the creator of Cydia, was. And uh, we had, a, we, basically, we had a presence there. So we were big in the jailbreak community but that no longer exists the blogs they jail jailbreak blogs and all that are very very yeah there small were now. actual websites dedicated to jailbreaking your iphone it just does it doesn't it's not there anymore and it, it's it's, it, it's dead <laughs> and that's the kind of thing it's that i'm dead. yeah it's just the kind of thing that i'm worried about with the kind of the future of Linux is that the newer generation just doesn't seem to be as curious into tweaking stuff like they're, they're used to using Windows that doesn't have a lot of choice. They're used to using Chrome OS these days. I mean, Chrome OS is like the thing now in schools, and that doesn't have a lot of choice in terms of actually doing stuff. And even if 
even the choices that do exist are oftentimes put behind, you know, parental controls because the the schools don't want you to to mess around with your machine. So you got to use it the way that it's supposed to be used. You know, it's like the 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 hype. Will, uh, what scares me the most is that for now, uh, and at this current point in time, uh, Linux is sort of a, like you said. It makes people feel like they uh, accomplished something when they use uh, Linux. This is how it makes them feel. And what scares me is uh, it's it's a hype. It it might die just like jailbreaking uh, died basically because there's a lot of podcasts and a lot of people talking about Linux and everything, but nothing that pushes you users because we keep talking about the all of us. We're not we're not. Uh, we're not uh, safe from that. We're not innocent of that. We keep talking about the toxic part of Linux in every discussion. That scares people. They they start getting scared. They they start thinking in their minds. Okay, I'm curious about Linux, but there's all these podcasts and there's all all these news articles, blogs that keep talking about the to uh, toxic aspect of of Linux. We don't want to join that. We don't want to join the toxic community. Without even them realizing that by using Windows, they don't have a community at all to begin with. Oh, so hold on, hold on a second. I have to disagree with you there because I I had that thought too that Linux doesn't have or Windows doesn't have a community, but they definitely have trolls. <laughs> they definitely they do have, have trolls. They, they I'm have, talking about community. <laughs> well, I think their their whole community is full of trolls because I made a video recently about Windows, and oh my goodness, the trolls in that conversation, that comment section is just kind of nuts. Um, it, it, it's it's insane. Um, uh, ham, yeah, ham, but what ham, I meant by community is uh, helpful people helping each other out. And yeah, yeah. I, doing, I, I, because I, Windows, you cannot do anything with to begin with, so it can't have a community the only thing communities you have is a modding community for games and stuff on windows but that's it yeah uh hamabu hamabu i'm probably mispronouncing your name thank you for the super chat he's he said they say um i only care about linux because of the user freedom otherwise caring about linux makes as much sense as caring about stamp collecting um and as somebody who knows a few stamp collectors i'm very offended on their behalf um, they care a lot about stamp collecting. Uh, it's I think that the word for that is philately, by the way, um, just to be a nerd about it. Um, <laughs> but I'll, hey, you know what? People have hobbies, and Linux can be a yeah. hobby. So um, I, I know for most... For now, it is a hobby. The way Linux is today, it's more for tinkerers and hobbyists right now. It's not really... It's not being picked up uh, really seriously by serious people. Uh, I mean, desktop users. I'm not yeah. talking about well, okay, uh, so, uh, hey, companies because they already use it. All right. So we, we can kind of transition into that just a little bit. So the market share of Linux has gone up a little bit, mostly because of the Steam Deck, right? Yeah. Uh, approximately half the Linux users out there now seem to be using Linux on the Steam Deck, whether they know it or not. Um, I, I do think, and we t I don't know if you were on the podcast yet at that time or not, but when the Steam Deck was first announced, Tyler and I discussed the idea that the Steam Deck would kind of act as a gateway drug to the rest of Linux. Um, and yeah. Tyler was, I believe, and I, I may be misremembering this, but he was of the opinion that some people would use Steam, the Steam Deck and then eventually that'd get them into using desktop Linux on their other machines. Uh, I was of the opinion that they just used it as a gaming machine and they wouldn't even know that they were using Linux if the experience was the way that the Valve wanted uh, no. it to be. Um, mm -hmm. I think that Good I would... transition because uh, this, this, this is very, this is very, very thing that uh, I wanted to transition into because yes, the thing with the Steam Deck is uh, more and more handhelds are coming out, and at some point there will be that diamond in the rough that's gonna dethrone the Steam Deck and it's gonna be running Windows. The Steam Deck ha is sitting on the throne right now and is in enjoying its uh, its leadership. But I don't think the Steam Deck is going to be enough. We need more harder handheld manufacturers to start using uh, Linux on their handhelds. But the way I see it, because you got the uh, the Aya Neo that, that's coming soon, you got the um, 
the Asus Ally, ROG Ally, and they're coming out with a newer one after that. Uh, uh, Lenovo they're just all a, using Windows. Lenovo just announced one that had a, has a huge screen and it's fairly and cheap. And it's using Windows. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's so I I understand what you're saying there, Steve, but I don't. Th I think that the problem there is twofold, and I part of it is just kind of beyond what we're talking about today. It's a Valve problem that they don't they don't come out with new products yeah. fast enough. They're a very That's small a Valve company. Problem, but it's what I'm saying is because. Valve, uh, because of Valve's problem of not sticking and releasing more uh, hardware iterations, it's not going to help the, the, the Linux adoption because, okay, as I see it right now, and we were talking about this earlier, the, 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 the increase of, uh, of Linux adoption because of the Steam Deck is only temporary unless something else comes out uh, and continues the hype. So... Just just one thing on that. Um, Valve needs to release actually release Steam OS for other uh, manufacturers to use, which they have yeah. not done yet. They said they were going to do it, but they haven't done yet. Um, so that like uh, two years ago. <laughs> yeah. So if it, I mean a year ago. at this point, I don't think that they're actually going to do it. I'd be surprised now if it actually ever happened. Um, but just to go back to the the, the main topic here, um, I think that. Even with the added influx of the Steam Deck, whether it stays or goes, that's kind of beside the point. No matter what happens, Linux is always going to be, I mean, I think you said it earlier, Linux is always going to be a very small portion of the market yeah. compared to, to Windows. And I think that, that that's kind of the point here, is that yes, we're going to have various influxes of new users over the course of the years you know things like but they're the coming and going they're not sticking well I mean, that's uh, the thing the thing we don't need them all to stick we just need no i'm not few, saying we need them, them all to stick we need more to stick right i, I and I, I agree with that but i'm just saying is that no matter what happens it's always going to be whole it's gonna be like mastodon so when twitter and elon did its thing mastodon had this huge influx of users a vast majority of them left after a oh, few yeah. weeks right but some of them stayed and then on is no and fostodon is now invite only also yeah it, it, it's slow and steady wins the race and more and more people you know, yes there'll be these big large influxes of people who come to use linux and then eventually leave but some of them will stay behind and it'll just keep happening until it just continues to grow you know very very slowly but my point was that linux is never going to be huge therefore the people who are worried about the whole dilution of the the ex linux experience don't need to worry about it all that much because it's never going to be I think that the the people who are really truly worried about there being too many noobs on Linux are in their minds thinking that someday all the people who use Windows 10 are going to come use Linux. It's just never ever I, guys, I love I love Linux. I want Linux to succeed. I want Linux to win. I want a whole bunch I, I think everybody should use Linux. Um but you got to be realistic. <laughs> like yeah. We, we, we've every time. Hold, before you say anything, Steve, just look, look every time. So we did this with Windows XP, and everybody was really excited because when Windows XP went out of service, everybody was like, "Oh my goodness! All these people are going to come to Windows, and it's going to be awesome. Win Linux is going. It's going to be the year of the Linux desktop." Didn't happen, right? <laughs> they moved to Windows 10. That's what they did, or Windows 8, I guess, Windows 7, whatever it was. Not a Windows user. I don't know what the order is. Numbers are confusing. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, they went to the next version of Windows. They just they didn't even think about coming to Linux. When Windows 7 went out of out of service, everybody in the Linux community was like, oh, this is our chance. This is going to be the chance for Linux to be awesome. Oh, a whole bunch of people are going to come use Linux. It didn't happen. They moved to Windows 10. Uh, when Windows 10 goes out of service in 2025, this the exact same people are going to say, this is Linux's chance. We're going to finally have a whole bunch of influx of Windows users because these poor souls who are abandoned on Windows 10 hate Windows 11 and the, Linux is their only option. It's not going to happen. They'll move to Windows 11 or Windows 12 or whatever happens to be the next one. Because Windows is all they know. And when they are eventually forced to move to something else, Windows is their only choice because they don't either they don't know that Linux exists, they don't care that Linux exists, or Linux is too nerdy for them. Right? It just is just there's too nerdy. There's another reason. There's a there's 
Okay, uh, this raises two things. The reason also why n not more people stick to Linux. We're not talking about people, uh, how many people try Linux. We, we're talking about people who stick to Linux. There, there's a, not, a big thing that plays a role in people not sticking to Linux is there's way too many ch uh, choices uh, for them. Uh, and I'm not talking distro specific, like too many choices, app choices that do the same thing, mm -hmm. not even differently, just diff a different name that does exactly the same as the other package, distros and, and other things like, they 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 keep like distros for example like zero linux like uh, hobbyist distros like zero linux that will come they will live for 2 3 4 5 years and then all of a sudden disappear because we are just hobbyists we don't do this for a living we don't raise uh, we don't make money out of this we're doing it and sharing our hobby with the community out there uh, and to, to allow them to come and use linux but will disappear. And people don't like to, they're too afraid to rely on something that will eventually die. But there are those big distros like Manjaro, like Fedora, like uh, OpenSUSE, all the uh, company-backed distros. Uh, those will live on and on and on and on and on. But there are smaller distros like us. They, they use our distros. They love our distros. They fall in love with our distros. But we disappear. And they say, oh, I, tr I, I, I joined Linux and I tried Linux, but that thing died on me. And how am I going to trust to go to another distro? What, what uh, makes me trust that it's not going to die? And this is one thing that uh, attributes to the fact that it's, that it's not growing. And when talking about Windows, did you know that in 23H3, 20, I don't know why they're calling it H3. There's no three halves of a year. <laughs> It's Windows, it's Microsoft, so they can divide the year into three halves. I don't know. But in 23H3, there will be ads in File Explorer. It's finally coming. And uh, the pop-ups have already started uh, coming from Edge, where they're advertising Chrome as a malware browser. And now they won't allow you to set, uh, to set a default browser, because if you receive an advertisement or something you want to click on, a pop-up from an application, even if you have set the default browser to Chrome or whatever browser you prefer, it's still going to open those links in Edge. It's not going to allow... You still have to go through the set by file type and by link uh, in the uh, default programs thing. So you're going to be spending 15 minutes just mm -hmm. setting each file type and each link oh, type I mean, manually. We can agree that Linux or that Windows is terrible. I mean, and it's getting worse. Yeah, no, no, but the, the, what I'm saying is uh, w uh, Windows, by doing this, they're defavoring their own operating system for Linux. But there's a, uh, this is the game. Now it's a game. It's a, it's a whack-a-mole game because Windows is going to be terrible, become so terrible that users are going to get so annoyed they want to try something else but they cannot stick to linux because of the reasons i cited earlier so uh, it's it's a, it's a whack-a-mole it's a it's a ping pong game it's they're going to go to linux not enjoy linux because they cannot trust it for lasting too long they're going to go back to windows get annoyed at windows eventually they're going to go to mac because mac mm -hmm. is the only th constant thing that doesn't change so you think that mac is going to be the ultimate winner out of all of this i'm uh, i'm steering that way but if if linux and windows don't i don't know they don't stabilize of sorts i don't know what other word to, to how to describe it the the only stable constant is mac mac hasn't changed really it just changed looks and how uh, sm small things at the back end but generally it's still stable and it's still the same os it has always been and i and i'm not a technical person when it comes to mac os although i used to work for apple but i still don't know what the inner outs and whatever of mac os are and i haven't needed to format my uh my 2016 macbook since i bought it in 2016 it's been running and it's been running the beta versions of mac os it has yeah. never run the stable versions and it's still running flawless the, the problem the, the problem with the argument of mac being the winner is the prices of apple if they had cheap 
computers. I guarantee yes. you would be absolutely 100% right if they had that's like why a... I said That's why I said I'm not really sure. I'm in yeah. the mindset. It's just that the prices or, of or hardware are way too high. Apple would win the day if they just put their operating system out there for people to use on all hardware. Like if you just like yeah. here, here's a copy of Mac OS. You can install it on whatever you want. They'd win like yeah. almost instantaneously. Cause, cause, well, all right. But let, let's put that. Let's put it a different way. If Mac OS became a true competitor to the market, because honestly, they're just as small as Linux is. Basically, I mean, yes, they because of their prices. Because right. of the price of the hardware. They have a small. They have a small portion of the market compared to Windows, just like Linux does. If Mac OS and Apple's hardware and all this stuff was a true competitor to Windows, what would happen would be that Windows would try harder to be good. Right now, they don't have to try. <laughs> they they don't have to try hard to be good because there's where are you gonna go? You can't go anywhere. Most people can't afford to go out and spend two thousand dollars on a Mac. So they, you know, most people got when they need a new computer. If if they if their computer app is like literally burning the house down, that's when they'll go replace their computer. Then they'll go to the Best Buy or the big box store. They'll go to Amazon or whatever, and they'll buy a four hundred or five hundred dollar computer. That's what most people do. You can't get yep. a Macintosh for less than six ninety nine, and you, and that doesn't come with a monitor, right? If you want an actual computer, you're going to be spending at least a thousand dollars, probably more. And most people just don't spend that amount of money on their computer. It's just a tool for them. Well, um, that argument. Uh, if you're they're more likely. Desktops, it might it might hold water, but when we're talking about laptops these days, uh, PC laptops are getting high up in the price. Yeah, range. I know, but you uh, can still like that's the reason one of the reasons why Chrome OS has become so popular is because you can buy a Chromebook for like three or four hundred dollars, right? And I, there, there's still the Lenovo's out there, the Lenovo, the six hundred dollar Lenovo's. But if you want to get something in the performance range of a MacBook. You're, you're paying MacBook prices yeah. even in the PC realm. Another thing that we have to consider, Steve, is that most people, a lot of people aren't even buying computers anymore. They have phones. You know, they spend oh, a th yeah. they spend a thousand dollars on a phone, which is first of all rather still, than paying it on a yeah. yeah you know, they think well, you know, I do most of my computing on my phone. I spent this much money on a phone. Why would I buy a laptop when I don't need one, right? Or why would like, I buy ex an expensive one? I'll just get a Chromebook or I'll get an iPad or something. You know, that's fairly cheap. Here's the argument. This is this is very valid, especially with Samsung phones. And I'll uh, I'll, I'll clarify. Samsung has something called something called Samsung Dex, mm -hmm. and that Samsung Dex is amazing. I've seen it. Uh, I've experienced this. Uh, experienced it in stores. They, they allow you. They demo it. And with phones becoming as powerful as they are today and having the Samsung DeX feature on board, which allows you to use your phone as a desktop with a few limitations, of course, because it's still uh, a phone OS after all. But you can do your, your office work, basically your Excel spreadsheet, because Microsoft Office exists on Android and on iOS. It's a big surprise. But uh, you can use it as, uh, you can do your work. You can do your Word, your Excel spreadsheets, your database, your PHP, your web development, all that on a freaking phone connected to a screen and a keyboard, a Bluetooth keyboard and a mouse. So, yeah, your, argu your argument is super valid, 100%. But if you have an iOS device, that's not an iOS phone. I mean, uh, an iPhone. That's not an argument <laughs> because iPhones will never be that, and tab even iPads will never be that because iPads are so damn limited by well, the OS that it. I mean, they I, they have gotten but, more powerful as time goes on. The, the iPads, so that's. But I no, think no, they're getting powerful. Yes, but, but they're not getting feature unlocked to be used to replace desktop. Well, no, no, and and what? I think that every time a new iPad OS comes out, people are like, it's getting closer and closer to being a computer. Like, no, it's not. 
Okay. No. I, the OS it, it, on it will never. Replace it's creating it. its own thing. App. It's it's yeah. creating its own. Apple's creating its own idea of what a touch operating system should be when it comes to something as big as the iPad, and it's never going to work precisely the way people have experienced computers for, you know, forty years. It's just this is not the that's not. It doesn't seem to be Apple's vision. Although if it had been Apple's vision to do that, they would have done it by now. And they would have just, yeah. I mean, you can see that they're trying to bring Mac OS and iPad and uh, OS and iOS all together a little bit where the applications on them kind of flow between the three of them, but the operating systems themselves couldn't be more different. You know, yeah, iPad yeah. OS and iOS are kind of similar and based on the same things, but comparing it to Mac OS, they're, they're different. They may look the same, right. but they function different, right? Um, to, to, to continue your to continue your argument, it's uh, uh, they're allowing you to use iOS apps or iPad apps, iPad OS apps on the MacBook because the MacBook is ARM based now. But you're still using the iPad apps; they're not optimized for a MacBook, so you will end up with a, a, a mobile app on the uh, on the laptop. Uh, and same for the iPad. For example, Instagram still doesn't have an iPad friendly app, so you'll be using an iPhone version of the app on the iPad. <laughs> remember so like remember the first versions of the iPad where you where they really didn't have a lot of applications so they had you could run iPhone apps on it and then there was like the, this little button down in the corner where you had to press two times is, and it would blow it up. <laughs> yeah. It's the same situation right now with between the iPad and the uh, uh, iPhone and the um, MacBooks. Uh, they all run ARM processors but <sighs> They still uh, and uh, developers are not optimizing their apps across the eco the Apple well, ecosystem. I mean, it's, it's still a, fragmented on the Apple eco uh, it, ecosystem. It's the same reason why Android tablets really haven't ever caught on because the developers haven't ever really adopted it, right? So let's let's. I mean, we kind of really I mean, we went completely <laughs> off to a left turn there. No, it's still related. It's uh, right. no, it's still um, related, but a little the, bit further. The yeah. Po the point of all this is that the choices that people have when they switch to a different operating system of their whatever are almost entirely hardware related okay when yes. they are going when they're considering making a choice like this what they're considering isn't what operating system to use it's what computer to buy so they go into best buy or they go into you know fries or whatever you know electronic store they can have walmart fries? or whatever no, i'm hungry yeah no, there, I'm hungry. there's an electronic store fries. called called uh fries here in the united states i think it's on the west coast but any, but anyways the you know they, they go into the electronic store they go online or whatever and they look and see what computer they can afford whatever computer they can afford that's it's the one that they're, they're going it's to buy windows. it's going to most likely to be running windows but some people do have i you know people have iphones so they consider Apple if they have the money like they may look at them they at least know that they exist right the one thing that they don't do absolutely don't do is go into Amazon or Best Buy or wherever and say hey that computer runs Linux let's buy that one because it doesn't exist you can't go into a computer store and buy a, a, a laptop that runs Linux you can't technically okay there's gonna be somebody in the chat that says Matt Chrome OS technically runs the modified version of the Gen 2 kernel, therefore it's Linux, blah, yada, yada. No, no, it's not. It's like saying Android is Linux. It's not what we're really talking about here. The point is, is you can't go buy a... Po it, it, System76 is one of the largest um, Linux-based yeah. vendors, right? They could become the savior of Linux if they put their computers in stores. You know what I mean? If if they if they yeah. if they had an agreement with you know Best Buy or something like that to sh to sell their computers in stores, I don't think it ever happened because the problem is, is that the people is that when Best Buy sells a computer, they have some obligation, not total obligation, but some obligation to support it and to sell it, right? So they have to be able to explain yeah. people why that thing there is different and running something else and why it's good. If they can't explain why it's good to someone or and why it's different than say Windows, they're not going to carry it in their stores. So okay, you just transitioned into something that happened to to me just today. Today I was start telling you about it before we went live, but I, when I went to the Virgin Mega Store, you know, 
I'm in Dubai. I we went to a Virgin Mega Store, and one of the employees there, I was asking about the Idea Pad Flex Five because that's what I I was looking into. But he was like, "Why do you want the Idea Pad? This is what the employee should ask the customer." Because I worked in sales, and that's how it works. He asked me. I told him Linux. He was like, "Linux for hackers? No, you want to hack? You want?" So I sold the idea of Linux to him. Because he was, I felt his curiosity about Linux. When he asked, the, when he, when I, uh, I told him that I needed, I wanted it for Linux, I saw it in his eyes that there was valid curiosity in there. Uh, I know how to read people sometimes. So when I started, I sold that person on Linux and he went home, downloaded, okay, zero Linux. I sold him on zero Linux, but okay, shoot me, it's my distro. <laughs> so he went home, downloaded it, and he sent me a message because I gave him my number uh, and it's a temporary number. It's a burner because I'm leaving after 15 days. So uh, don't worry. But I sold him on the idea. He downloaded it. He, he tested it and he liked it. And he was like, I think I'm going to stick to it. But you need curious people. This is what we're saying. We need curious people and curious people willing to stick. And you have to have the right distribution for that. You have to and the reason uh, not many people stick to Linux is because there's no good support community for. Uh, well, I don't. No, no. Hold, hold. I don't think it's about no good support community. It's just the the support community is too it's toxic. It well, no, toxic. not not always. Uh, what I was gonna say is that it's more. It's too all over the place. So if you want to, yeah. If if you're using Ubuntu, you have to know to go to the Ubuntu place to get the support. If you're using Zorin, you have to go to Zorin to get the support. If you're using OpenSUSE, you have There's to go. There's no to, general right. uh, and, and Linux support. Say you yeah. decide your first distro is going to be zero Linux, and you know that it's yeah. based on Arch, right? You know that it is based on Arch, and you're having a problem with zero Linux, but you know you catch steve on a bad day or whatever he's not around you can't ask him questions uh so you head on over to the arch linux forums and ask a question on your zero linux install that's when things become toxic okay because oh, yeah. oh, guaranteed yeah. they're going to say well you're not using arch therefore we can't help you and obviously they'll say it in such a friendly manner that you're going to have a pleasant experience right down the road right yeah <laughs> That's that, the problem. That's the problem. That's one it, of the it, biggest problems. It, yeah. It's not it's not that the communities themselves are inherently toxic. It's that they're toxic towards other distros. And and there's the 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 very high possibility you're going to end up in a loop. Yeah. Uh, support loop. Like they're going to send you to that point and that point is going to send you to another point and that guy is going to send you to another yeah. guy and then well, it's well, going to end it, up in a loop. If they even bother sending you places and don't just belittle you and tell you to be, you're being an idiot, yeah. you know? Um, so there's a lot of problems. Let's, let's summarize it. There's a lot of problems that are not, that are, uh, uh, there were not a lot, too many problems that are not helping Linux, <laughs> be uh, helping Linux adoption. Yep. And uh, as we said, Linux will always be uh, this thing that people will try from time to time, uh, that will be curious about, then get bored with. And like Glorious Eggroll today said uh, on on Brody Brody Brody's thing, Tech Over T, uh, uh, he uh, he said there will always be that problem on Linux that will cause people to go, oh, I've got a flash Windows again. Back to Windows, I go. That's always gonna be there uh unless windows becomes so bad like windows millennium edition yeah <laughs> well maybe then uh, yeah, just more to, adoption uh, yeah so i think that the future of linux is to remain a district to, to remain an operating system that is just kind of slow and steady growth and that there's a peak yeah. to it like it's it i could see it getting to like five percent six percent or something like that i don't foresee it ever getting further than that and I think yeah, that is... just just to kind of bring it back to the main topic, and then we, and then we can be done, is that because that's true, let's just say six percent's the ceiling. We're never going to have to worry about the influx of horrible new user coming in and making it a horrible experience. There for the will rest be of us. there will be a lot of a lot of new users, but no sticking. Yeah. Well, uh, and I don't see a lot of users sticking. 
I mean, we could we could talk about how we would go about fixing that. I think more a, a collaboration that of requires that requires uh, a, a people uh, to, like distros will keep on coming and disappearing, coming and disappearing. Well, but the, the big ones will always remain. We need yeah. the big ones to agree on 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 something called standard standardization without standardization across the board on linux it's going to be fragmented and well okay yeah, okay so the fragmented part is a whole nother conversation but i i don't think that i agree that there needs to be collaboration on the software aspects of linux because i don't think that that's going to ever the happen distro aspect, the distro no, no, aspect, no, 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 no. the hold, ideology hold the philosophy hold on a second i don't think that it needs to happen on the distro level either um uh, I can I can see the argument. I don't think that it necessarily needs to happen. What absolutely needs to happen is to is what we already mentioned, is that support needs to be generalized across everything. Where if if you are having problems with a Manjaro, you can go get help in the Arch forums and not be attacked because of it. You know what I mean? Um, people need to be more empathetic towards people who use other distros and maybe don't know that they're supposed to go to the to the Manjaro forums, or maybe they couldn't get help on the Manjaro forums because the, the people in the Manjaro forums are idiots. I don't know. I don't know that the, the people in the Manjaro forums are idiots. I'm just, that was just a general claim. Don't at me. I'm sure there are plenty of fine people. Uh, the, Manjaro, the, Manjaro, the, the community over at Manjaro are not very toxic. They have, I'll put it this way. They have helped me before solve a lot of my issues. I wasn't making I wasn't making claims that they are idiots. I was just I'm I'm just saying that that's a scenario. No, because maybe. I'm not saying that you did. Um, a lot of users think that the Manjaro community is a toxic community. They are not. Yeah. Uh, they just don't do it in a very good way all the time. But they are very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. Let's go ahead and move into the last section of the show, which is the thingies of the week. So, Steve, do you have a thingy what of the week? What was my thingy of the week? I forgot. I didn't have a. I don't know, man. It's though. not in the show notes, so I have no clue of knowing. Oh, uh, okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, I just, I, just, I recently discovered uh, uh, during my cert, during my uh, work on re the rework of Zero Linux, <laughs> basically. On, on a software manager, a uh, GUI software manager, uh, package manager for uh, for, Ar uh, for, Ar for Arch Linux. It's called Bauh, B-A-U-H. It's really good. It's really good. I recommend users try it because PAMAC, there's so many variations of PAMAC and one that is called PAMAC no snap, one PAMAC AUR, PAMAC all, PAMAC this, PAMAC that. And they're all basically PAMAC with uh, things disabled. Whereas with BAU, uh, I don't know how it's pronounced, BAU, BAU, whatever. Uh, BAU, whatever. <laughs> it's a great package manager. It supports app images. It supports web apps. Uh, it supports snaps. I don't recommend, I, I, I don't enable snaps, so, nah. Uh, it supports various uh, types of uh, package managers. It's super customizable, themable. You can. Uh, it has a tray icon uh, uh, and notifier uh, update notifier thing in the tray, uh, and it, the icon you can customize it. You can customize both aspects when no updates are available and when updates are available. You can use your own custom icons for both. Uh, you can create your own custom themes. You can. Uh, um, Oh, it's uh, and it's a Qt based app apparently, and uh, it's uh, it's it's wonderful, especially on KDE. Uh, yeah, uh, and it works. It's very simple to use. Uh, just enable, and it supports parallel downloads. The only caveat is you cannot set how many parallel downloads. It just says parallel downloads enabled or disabled. It needs to be more granular, but. It's a very neat little package manager, graphical pa package manager. Uh, since Zero Linux now ships without a GUI package manager, leaving the, cho the choice up to the user. So if you want to uh, try one on Arch, whatever distro you're on, doesn't have to be Zero Linux. It's on the AUR, just yay or paru-s. I said B-A-U-H. 
try it out and uh, enjoy. Okay, so my thingy of the week is a little script called Mirror Magic or Mirror Sorcerer. And it really only is good for you if you use OpenSUSE. So one of my main complaints on OpenSUSE during that video that I made recently was that Zipper is slow. Mirror Magic is a tool for OpenSUSE that makes them faster. It makes the mirrors faster, it makes Zipper faster. And while I would still claim that Zipper is slow after using this, it's not nearly as slow as it is out of the box. So I'll leave a link to this in the show notes as well. Uh, as usual, and if you're using OpenSUSE, Mirror Magic, or he calls it Mirror uh, Mirror Sorcerer in in some of the documentation here, so I, I don't think he actually chose a, a name. <laughs> I'm not sure which so, name so you wait, wanted to go. So, so wait, what you're saying is Mirror Magic is kind of like Rate Mirrors on Art, but for OpenSUSE? Kind of. Um, it's not. It, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's um not. It doesn't quite go as far as. Like reflector, Selecting the nearest mirrors. Yeah, to it, you. it's just completely automatic. You you run it and it goes, and it just run. It, it makes your mirror situation better. Everything's closer and it's faster. Um, it also changes a few of the settings for zipper. Um, obviously, it doesn't enable parallel downloads because those don't exist. Honestly, <laughs> if they had parallel there, downloads, zipper would be a hundred times better <laughs> than it is. There, right now. I have a question for you, since you are an OpenSUSE user. Uh, I know there's a GUI uh, package manager for OpenSUSE. It, is it Octopi? Uh, on the KDE version, they just use Discover. On the KDE, I know. On the KDE version, I know what they use because I, <laughs> that's the one I tried um, and I had Discover and it the, pissed me off. Yeah, they, they have Discover on the, op on the KDE version. I'm not sure what they use on the GNOME version. Um, on the software, uh, the GNOME software. Probably. Um, on the XFCE version, they use... I don't remember what they use. I've uninstalled it, so I can't tell you. But they use something else as well. They, but they don't use Octopi. Think, Octopi is horrible, man. It is no, so bad. Here, here's a, here's a, here, no, here's the thing. Uh, since I was on the hunt for a GUI package manager other than Pamac, uh, I, I remembered that I always had Octopi in my... Uh, tool as an optional package manager, and I remembered that I have Octopi with uh, the Octopi notifier thing in the system tray, and Octopi, uh, the only caveat for Octopi is it doesn't support flat packs, it well, doesn't support anything no, except the, 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 the local repository, uh, only local the AUR oh, and <laughs> Sorry, the only bad thing about octopi is that it's terrible <laughs> it, is, it is it is bad i'm sure it's very very powerful but you it, you can't figure out how it works i've used i've tried to use it I multiple figured times. it out i figured it out but you are much smarter than i <laughs> i've never been able <laughs> I to only use it, it for an hour i figured it out you when you highlight a package to install if it has dependencies it will automatically highlight those dependencies for you and if there are optional dependencies set by the package builder it will offer you those optional uh, packages via a pop-up window. You uncheck whatever you want to uncheck, and that's it. Uh, but where it gets complicated is when it's, uh, it's dealing with AUR, PKG builds. Then it gets a bit complicated because, for me, it kept on failing for whatever reason. And it's not very granular because it displays everything in the terminal window at the bottom. This is not really... Uh, May for me, it's not intuitive. It needs a pop-up. Maybe it gets, it's gotten get better since the last time I used it. I haven't used it in years, so because the last time, works. the it, last time I used it, it was works. when I used Manjaro. So, all right. Anyways, that's it for this episode of the Linux Cast. We record this live every Saturday around three o'clock p.m. Eastern time, or at least most Saturdays around three o'clock Eastern time. Every once in a while, we take days off, but for the most part, we're here we're recording. There's usually two more of us, and we have a good time. It's usually fantastic, uh, so you can definitely join us live. The Linux Cast uh, is available on YouTube. You can head on over there if you want to watch us live, youtube.com slash linuxcast. I did not do any of the contact information this time, so we should probably do that now. You, uh, you can find all of our stuff by going heading on over to the linuxcast.org, where you'll find previous episodes along with the blog post that I post occasionally uh you can find steve he's on mastodon at fostodon.org slash at zero linux yeah 
Um, with yeah, with with an X, not a Z. Z. All, all those links or whatever you can find at the linuxcast.org slash contact. Uh, you can find all of the other, of Steve's other stuff, his Discord, his YouTube channel, all of his stuff is is there as well. Uh, you can head on over again. Uh, the the merch store is still there. Shop that the linuxcast.org. I'll probably be pimping that for a while until I forget that it exists. Um, so <laughs> I, I I probably won't yeah, do that. And, and... And I want to say one last thing today. Uh, the comedy version, uh, the clown version of uh, of myself, didn't exist because there was nobody to bounce the comedy off of. Usually yeah. we had we have Josh and uh, and Zany, but all, all you had was the grump this time. It's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Um, Unfortunately. Anyways, so that's the contact information. You can support me on Patreon at patreoncom linuxcast. You can support me on Kofi at ko ficom linuxcast if you'd rather use that instead of Patreon. Also, you can support me on YouTube and all that stuff. youtubecom linuxcast. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just wouldn't even be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. Again, live every Saturday 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time with awesome podcasts so make sure you subscribe make sure you hit the like button head on over to Steve's non-existent YouTube channel anymore and subscribe to him um, follow him on Mastodon we will see you next week <laughs> <laughs>